Good afternoon, everyone. I am not completely sure that we're live yet, but uh, let's assume we are. Welcome to this seventh Quantum Delft web lecture. It's a monthly recurring event to present and discuss relevant topics in the ecosystem. And today we zoom in in the startup scene in France and the Netherlands. And it's really timely because we are working on a collaboration between the two countries. Uh, like the Netherlands, France also announced a large national initiative last year, and there's a lot of interest to join forces. So we are preparing an MOU that will be signed on the political level uh, around summer. And uh, startup support is one of the topics of this collaboration. So it's a uh, really great to discuss uh, all the opportunities and ch challenges in building startups and supporting them in Europe. And we invite the audience who's here to engage uh, in this web lecture by posting your questions in the YouTube channel uh, uh, and so we can address them too. So we'll have a panel discussion after the two plenary presentations that we have and we will hear from two startups uh, in France, one from France and one from the Netherlands. So let's start with our guests. Uh, we have Shane Mansfield and Shane is the head of the quantum algorithms at Quandela and Quandela is a startup based in the Paris area started in 2017 focusing on photonic quantum computing. And uh, they have a very impressive list of pro products that uh, Shane will go into now. Shane, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Frika, and uh, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to present Condela. Um, so I'm Shane Mansfield, I'm the head of Quantum Algorithms here. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of Condela first. Uh, Condela was founded in 2017 by three researchers, Pascal Senlar, Nicolas Somaski, and Valerian Gies. Um, it was a spin-out from the Center for Nanosciences and Nanotechnologies in Saclay. And at the time, uh, Nicolo and Valerian were a postdoc and a PhD student, respectively, in Pascal's group. They published a paper in Nature Photonics on near-optimal single photon sources, which got a lot of attention and a lot of people were contacting them at the time to wonder if they could get one of these, if they could buy one of these. And so um, they decided it was a good idea to turn this into a business. So with the aim of commercializing single photon sources for quantum technologies. I'll fast forward now to 2021. So Condela has grown quite a bit. Um, it's difficult to do an exact count because we're growing rather rapidly, but we're now over 20 employees, as well as the facilities um, that, uh, that we still use in the Center for Nanosciences and Nanotechnologies. We are now also working in a second independent site in Massy, which is um, on a direct train link to central Paris. Um, we're on target at the moment for annual sales of 1 million. And earlier this year, we had a presidential visit from uh, uh, President Macron when he was announcing his national quantum plan. So he chose Condela to visit on this day. In this time, our activities have also expanded from just commercializing the single photon sources to also include the in-house development of our own quantum computing platform and to develop IP in quantum computing theory applications and software. So I joined the company last September in particular to uh, launch this uh, wing of Condela's activities. The core technology at Condela is uh, the quantum dot photon source. So this was commercialized as a product called E-Delight. Um, it's, it's a little chip that you can fit in the, in the palm of your hand. And if you want to understand what's happening at the, at the kind of lower level in this, there's an electron microscope image where you see these little micro pillars. And at the heart of the micro pillar um, is a quantum dot, a semiconductor quantum dot. This acts like an artificial atom. So if we pulse a laser at it, we induce it into an excited state. And as it relaxes back to the ground state, it emits a photon. The cavity itself acts like an optical 
like an optical cavity, uh, which uh, makes sure that the photon is directed when it comes out. So we don't lose it, that it goes off in any which way. It's always directed and comes out of the top. Uh, so you can see the more recent generations of the devices on the right. In the most recent versions, we actually uh, pigtail a fiber directly on top of the sources for, uh, for maximum efficiency. So that's the core technology. Um, I'm going to briefly give a science slide. Uh, I think there probably will be some scientists in the audience who will appreciate this. If not, it'll be over very fast. So the question is, what makes a good source? And there are three things that are important here. One is brightness. That's the ability to obtain photons on demand when you when you ask, them, ask for them. The second thing is indistinguishability. And that's essentially how similar the photons are. And this is really crucial when we want to make these photons interact with each other so that we get good quantum interactions. The third thing is purity. So that's the ability to generate single photons only, not pairs or triples, etc. Because if we had these, that's very detrimental to the execution of algorithms later. So in the image on the right hand side, in the in the in the graph, uh, you can see the kind of state of the art in quantum dot technology. Uh, we're in this red region now at Condela and increasingly pushing outside of it towards this top corner, towards the ideal single photon source. It's also maybe worth mentioning that traditional sources, um, uh, SPDC sources that people used for, for photons, um, these are at a disadvantage in comparison to quantum dot sources because they necessarily have a trade-off in purity if you try to improve the brightness. So you can really attack all of the key metrics at once with the quantum dots. And we're at the, at the very cutting edge of this. I'll also make another comment about photons as qubits, because I'm talking about photon sources. And you might wonder what this has to do with quantum computing. So let's remember that a qubit is just a two-level quantum system. And I can give you, I can briefly uh, tell you about a very simple way to turn our photons into qubits. We can take two paths out of a beam splitter, and these, these will be our two levels. And then if I tune the transmissivity of the beam splitter, and if I put a phase shift on one of the paths, I can actually adjust these to obtain any complex superposition of A and B. And so that's any qubit state. So a qubit is a two-level system that I can put in any complex superposition of the, of the basis states. So it's a very simple linear optical setup that prepares any qubit state. So that's the reason why we can talk about photons. We can also talk about qubits. So that brings me on to uh, the Prometheus, which is our latest product. Uh, so that was released this year. And that's a fully integrated qubit generator. So earlier, you saw the sources. This Prometheus device houses the sources, but it also houses all of the additional technology that you need to make those sources run. So at the top of the image, uh, the black the black part, this is, uh, this is a classical computer that just runs the various uh, devices inside the trays. And if we look at into the trays, we have some electronics. In another tray, we have a pulsed laser. In another tray, we've got some optics for shaping that laser. Then we've got a quantum processing unit. I'm going to say something more about that in a moment. But right at the bottom, uh, you can see we have a very compact cryogenic system, and the light sources themselves are in there. So in terms of the quantum processing units, I think it's interesting to keep this picture in mind. This is a general scheme for photonic quantum computing, at least NISC computing. I could go on to say some more things about, um, about uh, large-scale fault tolerance, but I'll leave that aside for this talk. Uh, so we've, we've got a number of modules. It's a modular approach. First module is the photon sources. Second module is a quantum processor. It's an interferometer, if you like. You put the photons in, and you make them interfere with each other in a, in a quantum way. There are a variety of different materials that can be used from this. We work with a number of partners uh, to manufacture these. We do the, do the design and send them out for manufacture. The third module, um, it's the detectors. And so that's, relatively speaking, a mature technology. And there are many detectors available off the shelf nowadays. 
And the fourth module, which we shouldn't neglect, it's uh, what we do with the readouts. And so typically, we'd want to do some sort of classical algorithm on these um, to try to understand how we update the parameters for the next round of computation. So that's the architecture for a photonic NISC quantum device. OK, now I'd like to say something about um, the <laughs> Uh, how we fit into the the ecosystem, the European ecosystem. I think that's very relevant to this meeting. So what we like to think we're doing is working at getting the best of European technologies into one device. And we have a lot of partners, and this is a, a special thing about the European ecosystem. We have many actors that work together, and this is mutually beneficial. In the Netherlands in particular, I mentioned um, on the algorithm side, we have a partnership with Q and Co. But, uh, Especially on the hardware side, we work very closely in partnership with QX, who provide us with uh, photonic chips. We provide them with sources. And also with Single Quantum, who provide us with detectors. So it's really a, a, a combined effort, in a way, what goes into this device. If we zoom out, uh, it's also maybe worth thinking a little bit about the global picture. And you can see um, three maybe large poles that start to distinguish themselves. In Europe, we have, as I was mentioning, a number of startups that work together. So I mentioned Condela, QX from the Netherlands. There are academic groups as well who are pushing very hard on the development of the science and um, the, the demonstrations and proofs of concept that we need. So I mentioned Rome and Vienna here. And we've also recently supplied um, the Russian optical quantum computer at um, Moscow State University. So that's the European poll. In the North American side, we have much larger startups like PsyQuantum and Xanadu. And in China, of course, uh, you'll have seen recent developments towards quantum advantage. So we've got kind of three main poles. The particularity of Europe is that we have many actors who work together. Finally, I'd like to mention some reasons to love the photonic approach to quantum computing. Uh, historically, it wasn't always the most loved, but there, there are many compelling reasons, I believe, to take this very seriously. I also want to mention this in the Netherlands because you have some wonderful uh, startups that I mentioned who are working in this area and researchers in universities as well. And I feel that this shouldn't be neglected in the Dutch reckoning. So reasons to love the photonic approach rapidly. It's high speed. We're dealing with photons. They're flying qubits. We've got low noise and decoherence. Photons don't uh, don't decohere very easily. So that, that's really something special about this approach to quantum computing. We have unconstrained geometry, which can be very interesting from many perspectives, including error correction. It operates largely at room temperature. It's true that we have some modest cryogenics for the sources and the detectors. But as, as you saw, these can, in principle, fit into a rack in our Prometheus device. So this is nothing overwhelming. It's low cost, low energy consumption. Um, manufacturability is something that's also worth noting, um, many of the technologies that we're using, it's, it's compatible with the existing semiconductor industry, which gives us a path to scalability. And finally, something that didn't exist before, but that is increasingly evident now, is that there are realistic, scalable paths to large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computing using photons. And so we begin to realize that when people criticized this approach before, it was not that it was too difficult. It was simply a lack of imagination. All right, so I'm going to finish my rapid presentation at the, on that. OK, thanks, Shane, for this uh, great overview of uh, the startup and the photonic uh, field. Uh, are there any questions in from the audience? Well, maybe one from me before we move to the next speaker. So you see indeed the global landscape and the big uh, photonic uh, startups in the US. Is that, yeah, how, what is your view on that? Is it like competition or is it just a different phase or how, how what is your view? Uh, we're taking very different approaches in a way. So um, of the two North American, of the large North American companies, you could say uh, PsyQuantum are also working in the single photon regime. So the surface has a big similarity. However, they're really targeting straight away large scale fault tolerant quantum computing. They don't aim to deliver something soon. They're, they're 
they're in it for the long game and the long game only. On the other hand, we're really interested in doing some NISC quantum computing. We really want to demonstrate some interesting things. And we have some uh, experiments running in the lab this summer. So we'll have some first results out quite soon on this. With respect to Xanadu, for example, it's photonic as well, but they're working with a different kind of photonics. So that's um, the so called continuous variable uh, regime. So it's a different approach. It's also very interesting. There is some overlap. Uh, there's some scope for, for interactions here, but it, it's not, let's say, a, a direct uh, competitor in that sense. Okay, well, thanks. And of course, there's a lot of room in this new market for a lot of players in the ecosystem. So thanks. Um, then let's move to the next speaker, who is our own Simon Greublacher, our uh, professor in quantum nanoscience in Delft and also founder and CEO of QFOX. That is the startup that was uh, launched uh, only a few weeks ago, focusing on developing a quantum modem. So Simon. Thank you, Freke. You already took away all my introduction. So I'm I'm a professor in, in Delft, but most importantly, a CEO for, for QFOX. So we are an early stage quantum technology company and we're working on the on the quantum modem. So, and as Freke already mentioned, we have just started, we've just closed a seed round where Quantum Nation um, is the lead investor. And um, we've been working on this technology for, for several years in my in my research group. And, and gotten quite a few results. And now we are um, at a stage where we're taking this out of the lab and, and want to commercialize this. So what is a quantum modem? What is quantum transduction and why is it useful? So in brief, the quantum transducer allows to connect quantum computers to a quantum network. So this is the most important um, thing that we're trying to solve here. And you can think of this on the top right here, there's a, a picture of a dilution fridge, which hosts a superconducting quantum computer. This is, this is from Google. Um, and below on the top, on the bottom right, it's a visual visualization of an optical quantum network by the European Quantum Alliance that they plan to deploy in the, in the next few years. And now in order to connect one of these um, processes to a network, we need a device that translates the information from the processor frequency, which is typically at, at microwave frequencies, so gigahertz, to an optical network that's typically at 200 terahertz or so. So this is um, five orders of magnitude difference in, in frequency. And this is exactly what we need a quantum transducer for. And this is also why we like to think of it as a, as a quantum modem. And it's really um, interesting to, to make the comparison to, to a standard modem that you're familiar with, um, classical modem. So just like your, your, your laptops or your computers, they re also require a modem to connect to a network. The same thing is true for, for quantum processes. They require a quantum modem to connect to a quantum network. And so essentially, a, a quantum modem is not in any way less essential for building a quantum internet than a, than a classical modem is currently for, for a classical internet. And this is really widely knowledge to be the bottleneck for, for scaling quantum computing as well. So how, how do we imagine this to, to look like? So what we, what we show here um, is essentially um, two um, cryostats, two quantum processes. These are from, from Brigetti in this case. And um, what happens is the, the quantum processes they are located at the, at the bottom at the millikelvin stage, really, really low temperature. Already mentioned that they, that they operate at gigahertz frequencies. And now what we're planning to do is we plan to, to take one of our quantum modems, install it next to these um, processes, and the quantum modem now translate the microwave information, quantum information, to optical quantum information, and we can route it out of the cryostat from the millikelvin um, temperatures to room temperature and can connect it, for example, to another, um, to another quantum processes over room temperature links, over optical fiber networks that already exist. So in principle, this is of course not limited to, to just connecting two, but you can um, in principle scale this to, to arbitrarily many um, of these quantum processes. So quickly, how does our, our quantum modem work? How does it, how does it translate the, the quantum information from the microwave and the, to the optical domain? So what we do is we, we use a mechanical intermediary and that essentially connects um, to the microwave um, information through the piezoelectric effect, at the same time through radiation pressure um, through optomechanics um, to, the, um, to the optical um, domain. And so what we have to do is we have to design a device that essentially has an electromechanical resonance translating the microwave to mechanics, and then an optomechanical resonance that translates the mechanics to the, um, to the optical domain. And um, this is what one of our devices um, looks like. So this is one of our prototypes. Um, 
And essentially what, what we did here is we, we force colored the various parts um, in order to give you an idea of, of how this works. And, and maybe one thing, one interesting thing to note is you see the, the scale bar here. So this is typically orders of, of tens of microns. So this is significantly smaller um, than a typical superconducting um, qubit. Um, now, the way it works is if we, if we go, for example, from the microwave to the, to the optical side, um, we take the output of a, of a superconducting qubit, and this drives this um, electromechanical resonance and creates from a single microwave photon, it creates a single mechanical exc excitation, so a phonon. And we can route this phonon down this waveguide. We can, we can trap it there. There's a mechanical resonance in the center of this, of this beam. And now what we do is we send in an optical um, pulse, so an pulse of optical photons, and this actually evanescently couples to this to this optomechanical resonator and essentially maps the, the quantum information that's contained in the mechanical excitation into the optical field. And then we can route this out of this waveguide um, into an optical fiber out of the cryostat and connect it to another um, quantum processor, for example. Now, this is kind of what we're um, imagining the, the future to look like. So we, we don't think there, there's going to be a single um, technology that's going to be successful. I think there's going to be um, optical quantum computers, for example, like from Quandela, but also then superconducting um, quantum processes, maybe um, cube, uh, um, storage quantum memories that are, for example, realized in spins, various different technologies that, that will want to um, talk to each other on a, on a network. And the modem that we're developing is really the, the enabler. So it's kind of the, the nodes of all of these um, connection points. So it allows really to form a backbone of, of such a quantum internet and connect all these different technologies to one another over an optical network, ideally um, on, a, on a global scale eventually. So and um, at QFOX, um, we, we currently see, so the, of course we have this, we have this long-term vision of, of building this quantum modem, but already in the, in the shorter term, already using the technology that we currently have, um, we can already build something that's, that's really interesting and, 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 and useful for, for companies, for other, um, yeah, for other companies that, that essentially are looking to, to build these, these quantum processors. Um, so typically one of the, of the main limitations in scaling um, superconducting processes is how many qubits can you, can you put on a, on a single chip and how many um, microwave lines can you actually run down your, um, run down your cryostat. So there's, there's first of all a limit on, on the heat load you can actually put on the, on the cryostat as well. Of course, this is a, this is a financial issue. It's a general engineering challenge to, to wire up more and more qubits in the quantum processor. And this is really a, a, ma a major issue for, for scaling these quantum processes. So what we're trying to do now is we try to, to build a one-way quantum modem where essentially we use our modem as an optical readout for superconducting qubits. So we transfer the quantum information from the microwave domain to the optical domain, route it out of the cryostat and detect it in, in optical detectors. And this actually allows to replace uh, a big part of these um, of these um, microwave coax cables um, inside one of these um, cryostats, and um, with optical fibers that actually have significantly less um, heat load on the um, on the cryostat, and also reduce the complexity and therefore allow to scale these um, processes further. And then in the next step, we'll develop our, our full two-way quantum modem, where we really then will allow what I showed you before: connect various different computers to one another, start networking these together. Ideally, also um, network various um, of these computers together in, a, in, um, in, for example, one building, so you can actually parallelize your, your computing power and increase the qubit count in various different um, QPUs um, together, so you can really scale up your, your processing power as well. And with this, I'm already um, at the end, so I'm actually sticking to my to my ten minutes. Um, again, we are we are a very young company; we just started, so. Um, Together with me, um, this is the team. So Fred is the COO, then Rob is the CTO. Um, Bas is our, our lead scientist, and, and Salim and Pim are also our quantum um, engineers that are that are working really hard to to get these um, quantum modems developed and and hopefully make them make them a reality in the in the near future. And most importantly, if anyone in the audience is interested in in coming to to work with QFox, develop the quantum modem. We're currently hiring. We're looking for talented and excited people to, to come and join us at QFOX. Great. Thank you, Simon, for this uh, full science talk. And that leaves us a lot of time for Q&A mm -hmm. and also uh, get some questions for Shane as well, because we hadn't 
have them yet. So maybe start with that. Uh, can you read it in the in the? Uh, yes, I think I see now. Yeah, um, I see. Okay, so Alv asks uh, regarding the processing of the photons. How many qubits can you work with simultaneously? Um, that's a very interesting question. So yes, um, our sources produce, because we pulse a laser at the sources, and so they produce a stream of photons in time. And when you want to put them into um, an interferometer, you'd ideally like them to be entering all simultaneously. So at the moment, uh, what we're working at in the lab, we're capable of um, demultiplexing um, six photons at a time. And this demultiplexer is actually a product, which I didn't mention, but that, that's another one of the products that's available through Condela. So at present, it's six. Um, this is something that we will be pushing up considerably in the next year or so. But I should also mention that there will be um, a next generation of devices where we will be able to take photons from more than one source at a time. So this will considerably increase the number of photons that we can work with consider uh, simultaneously. That's more of a challenge because when you work with different sources, uh, it's hard to keep indistinguishability, but it's one that we're confident that we're on the path to addressing. Okay. I think that answers it. Maybe go to the next one, Epo Bruins. Which constraints and obstacles do you see for the processor part when one chooses to use Photon? Mm, OK. Um, right, well, there are a number of things. Uh, we'd like the processor to be low loss. So that's something that can happen with Photons that can get lost. Then we have to build loss tolerance into our protocols and our algorithms and our schemes. But um, ideally, we'd have low loss. Um, we would have. Um, fast reconfigurability as well. So many of the so there there are parameters that you can adjust in these chips, and we'd like to be able to adjust them quickly. So th these are you know t two sort of uh, key things. Um, at the moment, maybe in some sense, the more limiting factor is the quality of photons that you can put into the device that you can put into the processing unit, because the processing unit is it's ultimately only as good as the the photons you can put in are. So if they don't interact with each other, if they're not indistinguishable and they don't interact with each other in good quantum ways, then um, it's uh, it's all very well to have extremely um, extremely efficient uh, waveguides and so on, and it, it won't get you anywhere. But uh, yeah, so I suppose that's uh, that's a quick answer. There's also a theoretical um, challenge there. You know, it's not just a hardware challenge. There's a theoretical challenge uh, for for people like maybe myself and those in my team to think of clever ways of uh, of making use of the processors before losses and the kinds of physical constraints become too. Um, too onerous. So there are some clever ways around that, but I won't go too deep into it. Okay, great, thanks. And I don't see any questions for Simon, which surprises me a bit, but I think your talk was uh, very clear. Maybe, yeah, a question I can't help asking. Uh, I saw the team page uh, at the end. Of course, it's a challenge for uh, the whole community to get a more diverse group of uh, people in the teams. Uh, how, how do you look at this challenge? Um I see it as a major challenge and, and we definitely, I think this is one of our main focus at the moment, try to diversify the team. It's very difficult, of course, in the beginning, you essentially, you can't be picky. You have to take the best people that come and there is, I think we, we got a really great team, but I think it's really important for any company to have a diverse set of people. Um, I think that's, that's both um, in gender, but also in backgrounds in, in the way they come from, everything. So we're really looking to to expand our team in in every direction. Yeah. And how's that for you, uh, Shane? Is this a topic on your agenda as well? Yes. So we're we're in a we're in a big phase of recruitment as well, and it's something that we notice that it's um, well, it's difficult to come across people who are like well trained in the areas that are most important to us. Uh, so, you know, it's it's hard to come across people who have the background. There are lots of people who have, you know, um, 
who have skills in related areas and are very interested in converting, but to have ready-made quantum computing um, experts, it's something that we're trying to encourage the universities to take account of in France and something that has um, pushed us to, well, as well as recruiting in France to to, to look more broadly. So we've, we've also been recruiting uh, internationally for this reason. All right, and I see another question from Casper, uh, a bit similar in this direction. Uh, can you address that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, happy, happy to. So essentially the question is about, so far we've mostly used local networks of contacts to hire people. This was also, I think our, our first hires were all before we actually were public. So it's very difficult, of course, to hire before, before you're public from outside your own network. But we're currently definitely expanding this. I think when we launched, we so far got some really good feedback. We definitely looking to hire way beyond our own network. And I think it's again very important also for diversity to to hire outside the, the TU Delft, outside the Netherlands and, and and find people that just really fit into the team. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for this plenary uh Part. Then now we move over for the panel where we continue the discussion on challenges and opportunities for startups uh, in uh, Europe. And we have uh, three panelists coming to the stage. Uh, Ton van het Noordende, who is our investor in residence at Quantum Delta Netherlands. And he's also the lead of the Lightspeed program that supported QFOX in their first round. And we have Lydia, Lydia Barril. She's the senior program manager at Microsoft Delft. And she happens to be French. And she knows a lot about startups because she formerly worked for one in Oxford. And finally, we have Olivier Tonneau, who is the partner at Quantonation, which is a Paris-based investor with a focus on quantum startups. And Quantonation invests in both startups that are here today. So welcome to you all. And maybe, Tom, to start with you, as the lead of the Lightspeed project, you are very intimate with a lot of startups in the Netherlands or potential startups. So without going into the details of the cases, but can you s say something about the main challenges that you see for them to accelerate and scale? Yeah, of course, Frank. Yeah, of course, Frank. I mean, I think there's three things that uh, that come into mind. So we're not only working uh, with uh, the companies that have already been announced, but also companies that are pre-announcement and that are still in stealth. And there's the three consecutive things that keep on coming up. One we already tackle, which is the talent internationalization of the talent, the diversity, but also the lo the availability in terms of uh, the resources and the constraint on on funding. In first instance, are you able to afford the talents? And there's of course you know a growing competition around that. The second part. Uh, with, I would say, 100% of all the companies that we work with and have worked for, it's the fundraising side of things, most uh, importantly and primarily the discovery side. So next to the fact that you need to figure out if you're ready in a highly fundament fundamental phase of building a company with a lot of uncertainties, where do you actually find, attract and curate the investors that potentially could participate in a round successfully? Uh, and the sec and that's, I think the third and last part is also the respective, uh, let's say, underdevelopment of local ecosystems where there's... Um, uh, let's say an information asymmetry of on knowledge uh, in regards to anything except the technology side of things. So PR, marketing, uh, the things that are important and become increasingly important when you build a company next to the uh, technology part. Okay, so these are three challenges that you see. Uh, is this something you recognize uh, also uh, from the other panelists? Olivier, are these topics that uh, are on the agenda for your startups as well? Uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, financing at an early stage is, uh, can can be uh, can be tricky, uh, and, and and what we've seen, well, uh, Europe is starting to have a fund that are able to invest in uh, early stage deep tech, uh, and, and that's something that we've seen emerging uh, over the the last few years. Um, now, what's interesting is that. Uh, we see some uh, very, uh, well, in the, the two companies that we have here and, and where we have invested, there are uh, two very different uh, uh, ways of financing, uh, which reflects, uh, I would say, quite well the ecosystem of the, of the country. Um, uh, for example, at uh, Candela, the company was able to remain stealth uh, for uh, quite a long time. Uh, and and, and 
uh, was able to to get a lot of uh, public non-dilutive uh, subventions or, or grants or uh, scientific uh, competitions in order to to, to attract money, um, and and so they only had to open their capital quite late uh, in in the, the life of the company. Um, now with Simon, uh, what we saw is that there was some very interesting uh, initiative on equity. Um, uh, close to the university, I'm referring, for example, to Unique or referring to uh, Innovation Quarter, uh, which are really here uh, to, to trigger uh, the, the, the startups right when they start. Uh, there are also some early stage funds like us uh, that are able to, to jump in uh, for the companies. But uh, I would say maybe a, a bit less uh, non-dilutive and, and grants uh, available for the really early stage companies. Uh, so it's very uh, two different ecosystems, uh, and well, I believe that the the the, the plan, uh, the, the innovation, well, quantum innovation plan in both countries will will maybe help uh, set up some new tools uh, that will be beneficial to uh, all, all companies. Okay, so is this something you see as an advantage to to stay in stealth uh, the at longer than what? We do here. I mean, it's, it's neither an advantage or disadvantage. I mean, you, you just have to get the, the resources that you need. Uh, I mean, it, it's a worldwide competition, as uh, Shane mentioned. Uh, so you just need to attract as much resource to, to get your product roadmap going. Uh, Simon is competing against uh, US teams. Uh, Shane is competing with companies all over the world. So, uh, I mean, they, they just need to have enough resource. Uh, I mean, wherever they come from, uh, they does still, I mean, stealth is okay as long as it does not slow the, the company in its development and its uh, product roadmap. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Lydia, maybe to you. So, you previously worked at the startup and now in this big quantum global quantum program of Microsoft. What do? How do you see the interaction of these ecosystems of the corporate world and the startup world? Yeah. Good question. So actually, I have experience also at uh, IBM and uh, ST Microelectronics, and I work in, at uh, about uh, four startups. So I kind of get the picture from uh, both sides. And um, it's true that we both uh, need each other, uh, because in big companies, it's a little hard to really do disrupt disruptive technology, usually. Um, there have been a lot of thoughts about that, and there was a book uh, but uh, well, it's quite famous, uh, the innovator's dilemma from uh, Clayton mm -hmm. Intention, that you probably know if you're a hunting startup. So there are like many reasons why uh, you know it's hard to really innovate in big companies. From uh, you know taking a risk might not be so encouraged. Or, uh, it's easier to just upgrade your product to make money than really finding something new. And then, but for startups, of course, they absolutely have to be disruptive and be right uh, on track, really. They, they have no choice. They have to have a useful product. So I think uh, these things can really work together because also startups need big companies, right? Big companies have the resources, they have the money, they can, you know, uh, show um, you that you have you're on the right track. So I think uh, it's very important, and um, we actually do work together, right? Um, I don't know, but for example, for uh, Microsoft, there are like investors and accelerators, and uh, a program that is called Microsoft for Startups. So that's uh, a lot of stuff going on, and uh, I would say more practically, maybe for startups. I think it's very important to, uh, if you want you know, to, to work with a big company, is to be known. And it's kind of hard to get known because, as a, you know, in a big company, you're also very, very busy. And you might not know all the details about what's going on. You might be a program manager or you know, some executive. And so what uh, you need is to see the picture immediately. So I would recommend that you work a lot on your elevator pitch. And uh, you know, you, we have to understand what, what you're doing is like one sentence. That's my little advice. I've been there also, I've done elevator pitch. It's hard. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, both Simon and Shane have a lot of experience because getting uh, these uh, investors around the table, you need to present yourself uh, 
On and on, probably, yes. Okay. Well done, probably. So, Tom, what is your, uh, if, you see, if you see this uh, evolving in Europe and uh, the, the, the venture capital flowing into the companies, and if you uh, look at it also with a global perspective, what do you think are the challenges that we have in the Netherlands, but also in France, so in Europe, to uh, play the game? Well, I mean, if I just take some 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 interesting and some uh, really big numbers uh, to start off with, if you look at the global quantum system, I mean, from a from a venture and venture capital perspective, it's maturing at an unprecedented space. I mean, two thousand, I mean, twenty twenty one this year, uh, we're only halfway. One point three billion USD or euro dollars have been invested in this space. Uh, if you look at the last three years, there's been an influx in capital with a multiple of eight uh, in total. So. If that if that pace keeps on accelerating at this uh, this space, we'll, we're going to see essentially also potential complete markets evolve around the companies and startups that are being funded by the venture capital industry. That's on a global scale. Looking at then on the European or let's say on the national level, and then comparing France and Netherlands uh, or let's say other countries specifically, what you see is there is uh, if you look at all the if you would say let's say take a valuation account of what the companies currently are worth, which is also representation of what they could potentially do moving forward and how fast they can develop. There is, of course, some uncertainties and, and discrepancy there, whereas the uh, the total value of these individual companies in our countries is not that high yet. So it's I would say it's still very a fragile system. And uh, in, in regards to what Lydia just said, it's also very important and also what's actually to, to the point of Olivier that you as a company, you maintain uh, a certain form of um, uh, or that you can actually maintain your vision and you can do that by having either forms of un unconstrained or unrestricted funding and non-diluted funding. And if you have to choose for funding, of course, you want to make sure that the funding supports the vision, not takes over the vision, which is, I think, something where we definitely have to take care of, that we grow the system in parallel and not spin out or sell out too soon, as we have seen in other industries uh, uh, in the past in Europe as well. Okay. Is this something uh, that you recognize, Olivier? Yeah, I, I believe that... Uh, uh, early stage financing for startups is, is not really an issue. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, let's say early stage fund that that will help companies and finance them through uh, seed stage, uh, even Series A stage. Uh, now, I believe in, in this specific quantum industry, the challenge will be more to attract uh, large Series B or large C, C, C Series that, that that are able to compete with what we are seeing uh, overseas. Uh, the, the figures that. Uh, uh, Ton mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, 1.3 uh, billion USD. I mean, it's, if you just take the first two deals, and then it's already um, 800k, so uh, 800 mi million uh, USD. Uh, so it's it's a few deals that are very sizable uh, that are shaping the industry right now, and and so far they have happened in the US, and and uh, uh, well. We need to see some of them as well in, in Europe uh, if we want to, to keep competitive. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty much uh, my, my main concern would be how, how to attract deep tech investors uh, on, on companies at a very large scale on companies that are uh, still not so mature. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see a question from the audience to Lydia. Dear Lydia, why do you stress the importance to be known? To whom? Oh. To investors? Okay. So a bit. So uh, I know, but uh, during my startup years, I know we were looking to uh, work with the big companies, right? Uh, Amazon, if possible, or, you know, it was moving quantum at that time. And it's hard to. Um, to get in there, right? To be known to these people, and of course, it would have been great, right? You work with uh, Amazon, then you you're right in, and uh, then uh, if you don't have investors, then they will come, or you know, you you get a, you make sure you have a real product, and that it's interesting. So I think, uh, yeah, of course, it's important to be known to investors, but it's also very important to have a good product that you can sell, right? So that's what I was, uh, I meant. Yeah. Yeah, to, to build on what Lydia so said. So then maybe uh, we can. I was, yeah, we have a, a company that, uh, I mean, it's nice for a company to get grants, but it's even better if uh, they can get clients. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's yeah. the trick. 
Well, maybe Lydia, you can help the startups uh, navigate through the, the big Microsoft corporation uh, for leads. Yeah, then you have to make a, I don't take the elevator though, but you can find me in the stairs. Yeah, if we're, we can go back to the office, uh, yeah. Exactly. So back to the start. So maybe back to the startups. Uh, so Series A, Series B, big uh, valuation. Uh, is that also in your mind or is the talent part? Because that's something I can imagine that if there's being so much investment in this field, I mean, it's not you can yeah, uh, duplicate money, but you can't duplicate people. So there's a, it, it scars, I can imagine. Shane, maybe. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure who was going to take that one. Um, yeah, I mean, something that's very uh, strongly on our minds is trying try to have a sustainable development in this sense. Um, so we're very ambitious and we're, we're trying to push a very ambitious vision. But uh, yes, we are very aware that uh, this needs to be in phase with how, how well we can recruit. So for the moment, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> um, it's not it's not easy, but we haven't found this to be a limitation. We cast we cast a wide net. Um, we have we have strong networks. We've nurtured very close ties, not just with universities and research public research labs in France, but increasingly uh, internationally, around Europe, in the UK, Portugal, the Netherlands. You know, um, so this is a way that we can keep going like that. But um, Yes, it's very yeah. much on our mind that uh, this kind of development needs to be needs to be sustainable. We're trying to be scientifically responsible in this sense as well. Okay, it's clear. So we're getting to the final part of the panel. So there's uh, a question that I would like to uh, bring to the table. And that is that one of the goals of Quantum Delta is to break down barriers uh, to get this ecosystem to get more connections uh, uh, in Europe between companies, universities, investors, etc. Um, so what can we do? What can we do or what can the governments do to help this to connect better? Are there things we can propose to the Macron and Rutte to, to, to do to help this ecosystem or things that we can do ourselves. Is there any thoughts on that? Maybe Simon, you've been silent for a while. No one asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, happy to, happy to answer this. So I think, I think of course it's, it's, it's important to have events like this. So like getting to know other companies, seeing how the ecosystem works. I think with Quantum Nation, particularly for, for France, we already very well um, like helped. Like they they are introducing us to a lot of different um, companies that that we can potentially work with. I think that there is. It, it's obviously nice to to have like a, a vivid discussion, exchange of ideas. But it's also important like to to make something that is that is like tangible. So like really start working together. And I think for an early stage startup like us, what's always very interesting is to have some sort of like incentive, like a like a joint grant. I think on the European level, this. It's definitely interesting um, grants, but I think there could be something directly between um, France and the Netherlands. It doesn't have to be big, but just to really get the get the discussion going, get people on the same table, and 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 start start collaborations between between various different companies. Okay, so grants focused on startups, maybe for collaboration. Okay, interesting. Other thoughts? Uh, if I might make a comment on that, um, I think it. I think it's very important. Uh, so I, I had kind of a vested interest in promoting um, photonic quantum computing in, in my own talk. So for instance, I would say photonic quantum computing has been a, an ugly duckling of the quantum computing world. Um, something that I think is very important in a policy sense, broader than just my own field, is that uh, the policy does not reflect you know, old political allegiances and you know old commitments to one particular track in universities in a, in a particular country uh, i think policy should be open to innovation and not hijacked by what what uh, what the old professors want to keep pushing so that, that's one comment that i think is maybe relevant as, as as we think about what would be good for an announcement for a partnership for a 
for an operating plan. Yeah. So a broad approach, not uh, yeah, and a level playing field for all technologies. Yep. Okay, great. Other ideas, Tom. Oh, uh, Olivier. Okay, uh, so, so maybe just one thought. Uh, I believe the connection between uh, uh, universities, uh, startups, uh, and even public authorities works well. Uh, and and uh, I mean, uh, communication is quite fluid. There are some uh, nice projects. Uh, now, maybe one thing that should be uh, uh, more encouraged is, is uh, uh, the connection and collaboration between large corporates uh, and the startups uh, trying to develop uh, use cases. Uh, because uh, what we tend to see is that uh, startups uh, well, are working on their technology, uh, trying to develop their product. Um, I believe, especially in this industry, it's very important uh, to do it and, and, and having in mind uh, what it can bring, what advantage it can bring to your clients. Uh, and some companies have started doing it. We, we've seen a, a few uh, large-scale collaboration uh, with a, a bank in France, with an energy company uh, elsewhere in some countries. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's mainly by confronting the, the startups with potential clients and looking for use cases uh, that we will be able to, to, to uh, reap the, the fruit of uh, the low-hanging fruit of this uh, new quantum revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So big corporates, end users, and startups uh, getting to the table more to discuss uh, uh, use cases and applications. Okay. Tom. Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to guess what I'm going to going to touch upon, but of course, I'm going to look a little bit more from a fundraising perspective. So, yes, on the one side, there's more capital availability, uh, as well on the dilutive and on the non-dilutive side. I think what is important to I think uh, us as a as a let's say a generational uh, development and fast tracking that is also to look at the different instruments and making them as flexible as, possi as possible, which is definitely needed in this experimental and, and foundational stage. So, you know, regional investment agencies that are, let's say, empowered to collaborate earlier potentially uh, and are more flexible to look at the market driven conditions. And so aligning those specific instruments with the idea and the goal of creating this idea of best possible outcome where it's you know, return for community, return for a country or ecosystem and return for investors as well. So that collaborative approach, I think, is something that is definitely can be steered by, by, by on the public side as they, of course, has, have also the ability to, uh, let's say, denominate where the sums of capital will be deployed moving forward. Yeah. Okay, and you and do you think France and Netherlands is a good starting point, or should it be done on a EU level uh, all at once? I mean, obviously, I think both at the same time, and I think it makes sense to start with uh, with also the countries that have uh, that you know have been recently investing heavily in this. So, in that regards, uh, it's nice to, to have a fast start and a say a fast track to to set uh, together. I would say almost like a sort of like a framework where. Uh, we can learn from the French and vice versa. I mean, just to give you one idea, which I'm, I'm very uh, enthusiastic and also a little bit uh, jealous on, for example, something like BP France, which is you know a sovereign investor that is much more participatory, participatory in the system also on the earlier stage than that we have here on the pension fund side here in the Netherlands. So these type of best practices uh, and that approach to opening up those markets and those large pockets of capital will be, I think, fundamental for the development of the Euro European system as a whole. So absolutely, yes. Okay. So, Lydia, do you have some uh, things well, to share? Um, well, of course, it's important to share best, best practices and, you know, collaborate and everything. I'm just a little bit wary uh, of um, government money, right? So, uh, in some startup, uh, we were leaving off uh, government money. So, in the end, it's maybe not always so good, right? Because then where is the product? Who are you selling to? So, I'm kind of repeating myself. But um, so maybe government money could be more like uh, into facilities or, you know, or like you're doing House of Quantum or, you know, there, there, there can be some yeah. more thoughts. Uh, I don't have the solution here, right? But just, yeah. So invest in shared facilities that all startups and, and research yeah, communities. I think can that's pretty good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Simon, what do you see as possible things to do together? No, I think I think what Lydia just said. I think this is actually a really good idea. Like, if yeah. there was if there was more access for for startups to also facilities in the in in France, for example, um, that would be extremely interesting, and vice versa. 
I think building up a nice a nice ecosystem in, in Delft is, is is really great. And but we should also be able like to to have French companies participate or in general European. I think we obviously this is it's also good to discuss this between two countries, but I think this can be done more on a on a European level as well. Yeah. Great. Well, there's good news in in Paris, in France. There's also the initiative. It's called Maison du Quantique. It sounds a bit better than our House of Quantum, but it's more or less the same uh, concept. So, well, thank you all for being here for your presentations and your panel. I think it gave great insight in the startup scene and what's going on, what's on your mind, what challenges and opportunities there ha there are. I hope uh, the audience uh, got a glimpse of this and you feel inspired to also start a startup or any other way to contribute to the ecosystem. If you have any idea for a new startup, don't hesitate to contact Tom directly, who is with the Lightspeed program, aiming to accelerate you as soon as possible. So thank you all and see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.